So uh, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm Jarvis. This is Ben, my colleague from Dornaworks. Uh, we're from Southwest Michigan. Uh, Dornaworks is a company that specializes in embedded systems and services. Um, is anybody else here from Michigan? Hey. Hey, hey, great. Anybody else want to move to Michigan? Uh, we're hiring, we're looking for people uh, with some expertise in Zen. So if you're interested, uh, come check, uh, talk with me or Ben afterwards. Um, so anyway, uh, Dornworks, we've been interested in Zen for about the last five, six years, uh, looking how to apply it to the embedded space. Um, initially, we were looking uh, at some opportunities in aerospace, but since then, um, we've really uh, had a lot of interest in other areas like uh, medical and automotive and industrial. Uh, today, uh, we've uh, recently, <clears throat> in the last four or five months, we've collected some metrics, uh, performance metrics, on the Xilinx, uh, new Xilinx part that came out late last year, and that's what we're going to be sharing today. Um, overview of the, uh, the outline of the presentation, uh, we're going to talk about some, uh, we're going to go over an overview. We're going to, uh, you know, talk about our motivation uh, for doing this, um, to include like the metrics uh, um, and the, the tar hardware target and tools. Um, then after we're done giving the overview, we're gonna go through, um, go through those metrics, talk about how we collected that data, and then share the results with it. And then we'll have a summary where we'll have a Q&A. So uh, do recommend you save your questions until the end because we have a lot that we like to get through uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Okay, um, so um, first question is why embedded Zen? Um, are there any like embedded engineers in the room or, or most of you working with servers? I know the Xilinx guys are probably embedded. Okay, we do have some embedded. All right. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Well, um, so the reason why embedded Zen is uh, for a lot of the same reasons as we use Zen on servers. Uh, you know, the, the, the ability to consolidate while retaining your logical isolation. Um, it's also a way to uh, manage your resources in a, in a logical way that, uh, that makes sense. Um, also, our customers are asking for it. Uh, I mentioned before we have a lot of interest from aerospace, auto, industrial, medical. Um, and our customers are seeing it as a way to preserve their existing software architectures. So they're, they're you know, taking like legacy systems where they'll have you know, single core processors, uh, you know, maybe running different kind of software stacks. And they see that um, Zen pr allows them to consolidate those all on one chip without having to port their applications around or change the underlying software stacks. Um, why performance metrics? Well, you know, if you're gonna add a software layer, uh, customers uh, are going to need, want to know the cost. You know, is it going to be you know memory space, uh, latency, jitter, code size, uh, overhead? They're going to want it. They're going to, the, the customers are going to need to understand um, what the cost of adding Zen is going to have on their system. So, which metrics? Well, uh, some of the sort of uh, rules of thumbs that we use to determine uh, what kind of metrics we could, we could collect um, would be metrics that would be useful for a customer, um, metrics that would be fairly easy to obtain, and metrics that would be unique to a virtualized system, something that uh, isn't typical, you know, you don't typically run into um, in an embedded system. So given those kind of rules of thumbs, what, what kind of ideas would you, would you expect us to, to go with? What kind of metrics would you go, would you suggest? Crickets? <laughs> okay, well, what? Power, power consumption. Okay, that's not bad. Any others? Performance overhead, yep. Yep, that's a, that's a great one. Okay, well, the ones that we, we focused on uh, are boot time, interrupt latency, and context switch overhead. Um, and the reason we picked these, uh, so boot time is very critical in most embedded applications. Uh, fast, that, that goes the time from power on to, to the time it, it, the device actually starts doing something. That also impacts reboot. If something happens, they have to you know, come back pretty quickly. Uh, interrupt latency uh, in real time systems is very critical. Uh, that will make or break you. If you, have, if you have too much interrupt latency and you can't service your interrupts within a certain time, you know, if, if you have a real time, hard real time application, uh, that's a no go. Interrupt latency, depending on your application, can also be a source of overhead, going to that overhead point. Um, if you're servicing, if your application services, you know, thousands or millions of interrupts per second, then your additional interrupt can be a, a additional interrupt latency can be a big source of overhead. And finally, the context switch overhead, uh, you know, 
this is a new area of overhead for virtualized systems. In Linux, you know, and other, and other operating systems, you do have a context switch overhead. You know, you have an OS overhead. This is an additional overhead on top of that that the customers need to know about. Okay, so we're going to go talk a little bit about the new hardware that we have. Uh, this is the Xilinx Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC. It came out late last year. And as an embedded engineer, this, uh, this, piece is, this chip is amazing to me. Um, it has a pair of R5 uh, uh, processors. It has a GPU. Uh, it, has a, it has an SMMU V2, and it has an FPGA, so you can like, do all sorts of fun stuff with this. But most importantly, it has a quad A53 uh, cluster on there uh, with a GIC V2 and 64 kilobytes of L1 cache and one megabyte of shared L2 cache. And it's used, uh, it's currently being, uh, we have our development board is the ZCU-102, again from Xilinx. Uh, with those A53s clocked at 1.1 gigahertz, and the DDR4 clocked at 400 megahertz, and then a host of other peripherals if you're interested in doing development. Uh, okay, so, so we'll go talk a little bit about the tools now. Magic personnel switch. Hmm. So I'm going to talk a bit about the tools that we were using for this testing, and then go into some of the methodologies, and then starting talk about some of our results. So who here is familiar with Zentrace and Zenalyze, has actually used it, worked with it, not just know it's part of the Zen tools somewhere? Wrote it. <laughs> it's a gorgeous piece of code. It just it makes me weep when I read the source code. It just <laughs> So for people not familiar very quickly, Zentrace is a real-time event capture system that's built into the Zen kernel. It lets you trigger different event types, capture timestamps, capture variables, parameters, whatever you want. It's like System Viewer if you ever used VXWorks. Um, and it gives you this nice binary output that is really hard to read. So then we also have Zenalyze. Zenalyze takes the binary output, parses it, makes it into nice human readable form so you can analyze your logs afterwards, see what happened, run your data. It's a very useful set of tools. So in its basic operation, each PCPU gets its own trace buffer that it logs trace events into. Zentrace then collects all of those individual trace buffers based on a trace event mask you give it. So you can tell it, look just for scheduler events, look just for IRQ events, look only for my special subset events that I invented just for this testing, and it will phase out everything else. Collects all of those, gives you a log. Then you send that into Zenalyze. Zenalyze does multiple various analyses on it. It can tell you scatter plots. It can tell you core usage. It can just raw dump out the log for you to look at. And then you can analyze and see what happened. So we use this a lot of times in our timing testing, in our latency testing, to get data out of the Zen kernel. But there was a problem. Zentrace in current release Zen does not work on ARM. If you try and instantiate it, it will cause a page fault and fail. So the reason behind this is because when we switched from x86 to ARM and we switched to the new PVH memory map model, that broke the inherent memory mapping that Zentrace thought was going to happen. Because Zentrace sees DOM ID Zen as a PV guest. And it tries to not perform address translation on it, which causes an explosion now with the new memory map model on ARM. So we had to fix that. And then also trace timestamp. Its timestamp wasn't built into the new ARM timestamp routines. And Zenalyze simply was not being built for ARM. It was actually commented out in the make file. So we made a patch. This was based on previous work by Pavlos Sukov, if that's how you say his last name. I apologize. Um, and basically what we had to do was we had to create a special case for the Zen domain, where if Zentrace tries to allocate pages, allocates memory for the Zen domain, we take a special case, we handle that translation separately, and then we allocate the pages separately and return the memory back to Zentrace to get around the fact that its memory mapping isn't working correctly now on the ARM model. We then also implemented the TSC timestamp, so it's getting it straight from the hardware clock running at 100 megahertz for its timestamping routines. And we made Zenalyze start building again. It works. We've submitted it into the mailing list for upstreaming. However, right now it's currently in review. And right now it's being discussed by the developers if this is really the way we want to fix this. Because what we've done is we've created a 
special case for DOM ID Zen. That's separate from all of the memory mapping cases on the ARM platform now. DOM ID Zen is not auto-translated like every other domain now is. So it works, but the question becomes, do we really want to do this? We've created a one-off scenario. Would it be actually better to fundamentally re-architect the way DOM ID Zen is managed on ARM so it's not a special case. Make it an auto-translated domain. Make it actually behave correctly on ARM. Because the fear is we're going to get a lot of these single one-off fixes for it throughout the code. So we're working on that right now. It is in the mailing list. But we also have the patch available on our own local GitHub, if anyone really wants it. So now moving into our actual testing and results. This is the configuration we used. We've got the ZenZync distro version 2016, Peta Linux, and Zen 4.7, and we're running on our ZCU 102 testing board. So the first thing we conquered was boot time for Zen. So how long does Zen itself take to come up? We instrumented uBoot, and we instrumented the Zen kernel itself to place in timestamps that we could pull out of the system direct from the timestamp counter. And this is what we came up with. Over 404 samples, it usually takes around 876 milliseconds for Zen to complete its boot process. This, however, is contingent. It's mainly contingent about how much RAM you have. So if you increase your RAM, if you double your RAM to go from 2 gigabits to 4 gigabits, you get about 30% more time all of a sudden. So the page allocation, the page uh, referencing, depending on your RAM size, will directly affect this quite a bit. Also, your DOM0 configuration. How much memory is it allocated? What resources does it need? All of those can slightly affect how long this boot time is going to be. But this was average based on our configuration with 2 gigabits of RAM. We then looked at the boot time for DOM0. So Zen is up. How long does it take for DOM0 to come up? In this case, DOM0 is the Vanilla, Linux, DOM0, shipped with Pentalinux, and XCD. We didn't change anything about it. So it's not optimized. All the print statements are there. All the initialization code is there. We didn't take anything out. And in this case, we instrumented it to go from the endpoint of Zen to the two different points, to the point where the actual Linux kernel init is done, and then the point where all of the subsequent init tasks then complete. And what we found was it takes about 5.13 seconds for DOM0 to boot. Quite a while. So down here, start point is the end of Zen boot. DOM0 actually physically starts about 35 microseconds after, milliseconds after that. This is the point at which DOM0's Linux kernel has completed its most primary base initialization, the point where we start the init processes. And then this is when we finally finish all the init processes and the kernel is fully up. So obviously, this time frame in here is where a lot of optimization, a lot of configuration for your specific activity could be done to greatly reduce the time that this takes to boot. We then looked at interrupt latency. So on this platform, we have the Geek v 2 interrupt controller. And what it does is an interrupt comes in, and it primarily gets delivered directly to Zen. Zen then looks at it and says, OK, is this interrupt for me? Is this interrupt for a guest? If it's for me, it just handles it directly. If the interrupt is for a guest, it then writes into a virtual GIC and decides if the guest is ready to receive the interrupt. If the guest isn't active, if the guest is busy, it will put into a queue. If the guest is ready, it will trigger a flag in the virtual GIC which will then deliver it to the guest. As far as the guest is concerned, it got it directly from the GIC. It has no idea it's been virtualized. It has no idea it's reading a virtual interface. So this is the process that we're looking at. And we were primarily interested to know how long does this take? So this side is hardware. We can't speed it up. That's as fast as it goes. But then how much overhead does this entire Zen process then add to the interrupt handling that your user is then going to have to experience? So we tested this two different ways. First was we just plain timed it. So we put trace timestamps into the interrupt handling routines and measured 
how long the interrupts took to execute. And from that, we get about 2.35 microsecond overhead that Zen provides. So this isn't the entire interrupt processing time. This is just the amount of time that Zen itself contributes that would not be present in a native environment. And you see we get a couple outliers out here. Those happened when we got two IO queues at the same time, so they queued. So both were being processed by the time. Now, as a guest, you may or may not actually see that. If both are for you, you may see both of them come in. But if they're for different guests, you wouldn't actually experience that time delay. The second way we tested GPIO is based off a format Global Logic used, which was we used some GPIO. So we had one GPIO switch on the board, and we had a LED. And basically, we said, OK, we hit the button, triggers an IRQ, triggers an interrupt. That interrupt triggers the LED. So hit the button, the light turns on. Hit the button, the light turns off. And by measuring with an oscilloscope the time difference between those two events, we could get a very good estimate of the interrupt latency. Right? So when we did that, we came up with these lovely charts. This is the native latency. So this is our test running with no Zen whatsoever directly on the hardware. Button gets pressed, LED turns on. And we came up with about 310 nanoseconds just for the native raw interrupt handling. It takes about 310 nanoseconds. We then did the same thing with the test running as a guest in Zen. And in that case, we came up with about 2.58 microseconds. So then if you take that, subtract out the native, you're then left with just the contribution of Zen, because we've canceled out now the native contribution. So that comes to about what we saw before, about 2.3 microseconds, is the amount of interrupt latency that Zen itself is providing into the system. OK. Uh, the next thing we looked at was some of that overhead uh, from the context switching. Uh, so we did a few different configurations. Uh, we looked at the, the default credit scheduler, and we looked at uh, the Arinx 653 scheduler. And on both of them, we tried two different configurations, where we put two domains on one core, in core 0, or we put the, in another configuration was we put the domains on their own cores, uh, pinning them to the core. Uh, what we found for the credit scheduler is that uh, you know, even, even with both of the domains running on the same core, the expected overhead was quite low. Right? We're talking four hundredths of a percent. Um, it's even better when we split them out and we run them on their own cores, Dom, particularly DOM1, the guest that, we're, you know, the, the, that the customer would be concerned about, um, is you know, 0.008%. <clears throat> when we look at the Arinx 653 scheduler, uh, it's a bit worse. Uh, when we put the two domains on the same core, uh, you know, a tenth of a percent approximately expected. Um, but when we split them out onto their own cores, uh, it, gets a lot, it gets a lot better. Now, a uh, little caveat, uh, back up a slide. Uh, the, for the credit scheduler, we're using the default time slice of 30 milliseconds. And for the Arinx 653, we're using a, um, a major frame of 200 milliseconds. A so major frame, that's approximately the, that's how frequently the, the scheduler should run. So the question is, um, did we really, you know, you know the, the, notice the weasel word of expected overhead. You know, just based on these measurements, we, we would we expected to see a certain percentage of overhead. Now, we were wondering if that was actually going to be the case. So we ran another experiment where we developed an application that ran some dry stones, just to, uh, some dry stone benchmarks, just to exercise the CPU. Uh, we ran that natively to get a baseline number. And then we reran it as a guest with a number of different time slices. Um, obviously, the, the smaller the time slice, the more overhead we would expect, as there would be more uh, scheduling and context switching potentially going on. Um, so based on those results, uh, we found out that no, we did not uh, correctly uh, measure all of the context switching. In fact, we were off by about a factor of six. But what we did find was that it, uh, um, for, the, for about three milliseconds, uh, time slices and up, uh, it was pretty constant. It was, it was a factor of six. So that tells us that, okay, we didn't measure all of the scheduler, all of the context switch correctly, but that is the major source of uh, overhead in our system. 
Um, and if once you get out here with the credit-based scheduler, after when you set a time slide of about 1,000 milliseconds, um, the difference between running natively and running as a guest practically disappears. I, I couldn't detect it. My, my results were the same with my, the sensitivity of my measurements. Um, it's interesting to note that below three milliseconds, uh, performance actually improves. Uh, you know, our, our overhead decreases. Um, I'm guessing that there's a special mode in the scheduler when it gets the time slice gets really small and goes into a polling mode or something. Yeah. In in the scheduler. Yeah. So I, I think yeah. Anyway. I, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so that was, uh, that's what we found with that. So um, even so though, even with a factor of six, we looked at the previous slide, uh, the worst case we saw were two cores running, uh, sorry, two domains running on the same core on an airing scheduler, it was 0.1%, so that's 0.6%, that's you know, still less than a percent, it's, it's really marginal. So um, really to summarize uh, what we found then, uh, looking at the implications uh, with the boot time, of uh, you know, with Zen uh, 0.8 seconds and the domain 5.1, that really tells us uh, we need to we need to focus on uh, optimizing that that Linux that demo um, to improve our times, and also by improving the Linux um, boot up time, we'll you know optimizing out drivers and things like that. That'll make some of our uh, subsequent tasks easier as well because there'll be less in there to have to analyze and determine the impact on the system. Um, with an interrupt latency of about 2.3 microseconds, um, you know, the, the question is, well, is, is that acceptable by a customer? Uh, we do have some embedded customers uh, who that's acceptable to them. Uh, a, a commercial hypervisor uh, claims to have an interrupt latency of about 2 microseconds. Um, so we're on par with that. Uh, a 2011 VDC poll uh, shows that less than 10% of, pro of embedded projects need a interrupt latency of less than five microseconds. So pretty strong indications that 2.3 microseconds uh, will be acceptable to most customers. Uh, additionally, 2.3 microseconds is a lot better than the 20 or 30 microseconds that were kind of got out there was being reported back in 2014. Uh, some embedded customers, they, got, they found those old uh, uh, mailing lists and saw those numbers and were spooked. So um, they, were a lot, they, they were very pleasantly surprised when we came back and told them about the 2.3. Uh, the context switch overhead, you know, without doing much, it's already pretty negligible. Uh, and if you configure it uh, correctly, you can get it down to approximately 0% with a large, you know, pinning the guests to their own cores and giving uh, large uh, time slices, particularly in those cases uh, where they're, they're pinned to their own core. Uh, so future work, I've already talked about optimizing the DOM boot time. Uh, there are some things, you know, we have some ideas about optimizing the Zen boot time. Uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, the Zen boot time is highly dependent on the amount of RAM that's in use. Uh, is, it's like 30% is of the time spent is setting up page tables, I think, um, the, the end boot allocator function. Um, about 25% is spent on setting up the DOM O itself, DOM O create. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's why I said before that optimizing our DOM zero will help with optimizing our Zen boot time as well. Uh, you know, our, our embedded uh, customers, um, a very, Typical configuration is Linux in one domain and bare metal on three others, each of them pinned to their own core. So that's a very common configuration that uh, we think we can provide some optimizations in the interrupt handling to speed that up for those cases as well. Uh, obviously, you know, go back and look at our traces to see where we, we're missing time to, to improve our uh, estimate performances, um, and then get into measuring jitter and calculating worst case execution time. All right, uh, at this point, uh, would, we can ask some questions. Yes? Do you have an idea, like, could you measure how long it takes if you're running depth mode just to go under the hypervisor and straight back out again? So, yeah, make it to complete a hypercall, right. Uh, uh, no, we haven't, but that is a great one to do. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. 
I would expect it to be. So for our typical customer, they're not interested in making hypercalls directly, sure. right? So that sort of... Uh, that, that's going to limit your, how fast your customers like, interrupt. Uh, and right, right, right. Well, there's a lot more that goes in with the context switches other than just calling down into Zen in the first place. It's, it, it, making the hypercalls would be if there's a service they need from, from Zen itself. And for the most part, they, they want to pretend like Zen doesn't exist. They just want to use Zen to manage you know, keep things separated and so they can throw three bare metals on and run their Linux as well and have their cake and eat it too. So, but that's, that is a good, that's a good one to, to measure on this board. So, but I mean, like, say, if, if there's, you're basically interrupt, like, if you interrupt, you, you're switching from the guest into that and then back again, right? So, 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 so e even if Zen could manage the interrupt. Right, I see what you mean. You, you need the context switch into Zen to handle the interrupt, so there's a little bit more, yeah, yeah there's a little bit more time in but. Yeah. More sure. Good point. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's an average value for the GPIO. We uh, that was a manual process, so we did it 40 times to get those averages. Uh, for the uh, other one, for based on the timers that we were running, uh, we were running cyclic test uh, in the guest, hammering it. Um, I I think we have, I, I, you did that one. Do you remember how many? I mean, thousands, I think thousands yeah, of samples. Thousands, thousands of times. So that's a pretty good, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, on the left-hand side there, you know, we have about 1,300 for the peak, and then, yeah. I, so this, this is a cyclic task. What's that? The cyclic task. Yeah. Yes. The test is generating the interrupts, basically, for us to measure. So this is the latency in Zen that Zen would add, not the total latency that Linux, a Linux guest would see. Because Linux itself is going to contribute um, quite a bit of latency as well, where it's handling then of the interrupt that's vectored to it. Uh, no, we don't have that data. So that's then completely dependent on your guest OS, which is? We're trying to abstract that so anyone can you know, decide on what they want. Edgar, you had a question? <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yes, Julian. Say that again. Uh, <laughs> so, so what you did is just you wait yeah. uh, all the system all the steps. But mm -hmm. from the end point of view, it's not necessary that you would do the system all the steps and during the story, then doing the order instructions. The processor is free to re reorder the instruction in the way it wants. You mean in the actual pipeline? Yes. So you have like yeah. Uh, Sure. So, so, but that would be a minor, you know, variation to it. I mean, how much would that account for, really? Hmm. Yeah, I, I could. So, so I mentioned before, like looking at it, the jitter, um, doing a jitter analysis. That's when we're going to start getting more deep into those things, those those kind of effects as well. So this was a. Prior to this, we really didn't have anything. We had customers being like, can we even use Zen in our system? So this was the motivation for getting some of this data. But that's good. That's a good thing to take away. Thank you. And I should mention, too, that um, in all of these tests, the, the Zen trace itself, the trace calls do add an overhead. So there is some inherent overhead just from the use of even gathering the timestamps and all of the routines.
Yeah, we didn't we didn't do anything special with it. We just did we used all the default behavior. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right, so it's only one core doing it. Other, the other cores haven't been fired up yet. Oh, do you? Okay. Okay, well, let's have to take a look at that. Okay. Yes? I'm sorry, so what's that? How much is this for? How much is the board? Uh, <laughs> Edgar, was that about $5,000? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the ZCU, um, I believe, has right now has a price tag, I want to say about 5000 or 5500 um, but that's sort of like an early adopter fee, too. Um, I believe it's going to go down in the near future. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, there are other boards. I do know there are other boards using the uh, MPSOC coming out. Um, uh, outfit called Ivea. Is, uh, has designed a board and is shipping them as well. Um, and we're actually going, Dornaworks will be uh, porting um, the Zen Zinc distribution to it uh, uh, when, when that becomes available to us. <laughs> All right, where am I going backwards? Going forwards, okay. Um, funny you mention that. Uh, so this presentation, it'll be post pushed up to our forum, um, publicly available, um, this presentation. Uh, we do have our Zenzink distribution is freely downloadable as well um, to, to use on this platform. Um, yeah, so we'll have all that information out there. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, we work very closely with Xilinx, so we take, um, so, so we kind of take what Xilinx has for their Zen, so they, so they, they yeah. downstream from, from Zen Project, we take what they have and then we downstream some stuff as well, so usually if it works for, when Xilinx reports it works on a board, you know, it'll work for us too, but, yeah. yeah. Okay, so do I contact you for that? Pardon? I contact you for that to let you know? Uh, yeah, well, actually, we just, uh, we have a set of guys, as I said, on a mailing list before we release, you know, okay. and then the release manager just. Uh, we'll include that. All right. And then Zen, on the Devel? Yeah. Okay. On the Devel, there will be a, there's a regular release um, part of the mail sent out like okay. that. Okay. Yeah, so just like. That, I mean, the break, and I'll explain the, how the process works. <laughs> yeah. Set up a mail filter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I don't get a thousand a week. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. So you mentioned that the calculator the key access interval. Do you have any idea how to calculate it? How to calculate the worst case execution timing? Um, we have a lot of experience in the company uh, from doing worst case execution timing analysis uh, for some aviation, uh, 787 stuff we did. Uh, actually, the, the, the lady who was in charge of it used to work at GE Aviation and is now works for Dornaworks. So we have experience doing that. I don't know the specifics off the top of my head. So are you doing like static gymnastics or do you measure? It's gonna, well, you can't measure, you know, unless you can exercise the worst cases, measuring it is, is you know, you, if you measure just whatever, then you're going to get an average. You're not necessarily going to get the worst case. So you have to find out ways to force it into a worst case, and then the things you, you know, and then an, anal, and then there's analysis as well with it. So it's a combination of both. Um, all the techniques. I'm not entirely up to date on all the techniques, but we have that experience in house, so that we're going to we're going to lean on. Yeah, 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, we, it does. It does involve a lot of you know modeling the hardware and figuring out what the worst case on the hardware is. So I'm not. I know some older architectures that had a non-deterministic, uh, particularly when it came with um, uh, I think cache, the, the cache lookups, something. So. Um, so I, don't, I don't know about this particular platform where the non-determinism comes in. All right, I think we're out of time. So the last question is oh. uh, open Zoom class. Uh, hmm. So you mentioned that uh, there was some discussion going on on the main list. Uh, last time, on, I remember it was like, we, I think we already agree about something. So it seems to be your call to send the new versions on the Zoom class. Did we come to an agreement? I'll have to, have to re-look at them. I don't think we've come yeah. to an agreement yet. Okay. And um, is there no agreement that we have to uh, go further on the main list? Maybe we'll put that for the product type. Mm -hmm. So the feature space in two weeks, not. Uh, but I don't think there was many things on your series. And yeah, we were, just, we were just on that last item. Everything else we pretty much could act, except for just that last. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. I should be, it would be nice to have that for the main